Hi, and welcome back. We're almost ready now at the completion of this third little segment to finally get into the, yes, in this sandbox, there exists a solution for the mission we're interested in, which is flying fast around the world. And we've driven now back to the, the last episode where I showed you the velocity and temperature, right? It's really your choice of temperature here on the right picks your altitude, really just picks your dynamic pressure. And, and that on the first episode, we were trying to understand sort of the standard way of looking at aircraft, which is thrust to weight and then wing loading and what, what configurations, where do we sit in there? Um, and so now that we have a better idea on the dynamic pressure, we can start filling out that equation. And then also we took a look at what happens to lift and drag when you're flying supersonically and how that starts impacting you and how there may actually be it's sort of a limitation on the maximum amount of wing loading you're able to, to get. And, and you're gonna see, right, both the temperature and that wing loading are gonna drive, are gonna drive hypersonic high-speed vehicles to a, a lower wing loading, which is a little bit counterintuitive to, to what most people have been, been thinking. Uh, and that also is gonna then drive you higher. And so that's, that's why that, the detonation engine with working the ramjet, it's beautiful, it allows us to fly higher. And so I'm gonna finish out this time and then get, get to that you know, final picture of ultimately we're interested in the range. And so I've written over here just a reminder that the speed that you wanna fly at and the temperature you're willing to fly at, that really sets your altitude. So I'm gonna get rid of this plot on the right. Uh, I've got then the rocket equation and we've got sort of a, again, you know, not that you have a constant ISP, this would be for a constant ISP, but also this kind of penalty term, right? That the, the more you thrust, the, the higher your thrust, the, the less the penalty, the less time you're spending uh, in the drag, wasting away. And then of course your lift to drag, which we talked about a little bit. And so this is how you're gonna find the amount of propellant to get up to the cruise speed. So I'm gonna leave that there. Uh, and, and then just as a reminder that, you know, this ISP is not constant and I drew this last time, but for our detonation engine, it's gonna look something like that. And so we'll have an ISP that, um, let's say, Mach one, two, three, four. We'll have an ISP, uh, and this is not quite high enough, so I'm actually gonna tweak this. Maybe a little bit lower. There we go. And so this ISP is roughly uh, 2,000. 2,000 at Mach 3. At Mach 4, it's 1,500. And so you, you get this one over V, that, that ramjet. So it's roughly, and so in the end, you know, this form is going to follow basically, we'll say this 6,000 over Mach. Uh, and that, you know, we are getting kind of 700 to 1,000 in this mixed detonation mixing with air configuration as, as we're starting to light the ramjet. And then we start throttling that ramjet or the start throttling the detonation engine down and getting more into the ramjet flight. That's how our curves start coming up. Uh, so that's the ISP. And that, that's when we need that portion to estimate here how much propellant is getting to cruise condition. Okay, but then how much can you actually carry? And so then that's a bit of, if you remember the other equation we hadn't quite talked about is, is beta. What's the, what's the amount that your aircraft is willing to get to in terms of a propellant load? And so on this plot, this is uh, giving you a nice kind of log log plot. Uh, I'll talk about it on the bottom in, in units of pounds in terms of takeoff weight. But you have sort of a range of aircraft, whether it's, you know, your jet trainer, gen general aviation twin, uh, jet fighters, jet transport, military cargo bombers. You, you can get an idea of what the, this is the empty weight, right? And so if you take a look at, say, a general aviation twin, Something about like that, that might be coming around, you know, takeoff weight of um, you know, 10,000 pounds would be kind of a big general aviation aircraft. Maybe it's more like 5,000 pounds. You know, you're, you're talking about 35% kind of at that 0.65, 35% of what the vehicle is, is you know, fully loaded is its fuel. And so this is going to give us limitation, right? You, you sort of have that the bigger the aircraft are, the more you can pack weight into it. And that's that's more of a material thing. Normally driving most of this is that uh, we usually have a, um, a minimum gauge thickness on metals that we're willing to do, right? We can only make the wings so thin, right? And it's, it's not necessarily a strength issue. It's a, you know, a puncture issue. 
right? So this is a lot of why um, people don't necessarily appreciate how the strength to weight of aluminum is actually roughly the same as the strength to weight of steel. Now, the reason you don't see steel aircraft around is because you know, if, if both can achieve the same amount of performance, the steel aircraft, the steel skinned aircraft would be tiny, 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 tiny thin, and it would never work because you, again, just a hammer dropping on it would just completely, completely puncture it. Uh, whereas an air, you know, aircraft made out of aluminum, it would be still thin gauge aluminum, but it's enough to kind of handle that, that impact resistance. And so uh, really the, the, these curves, this is the general trend, but most of that is driven by uh, the material of choices. And so that's why you're, you're going to see aircraft with titanium, aluminum, um, and then that's why composite is, is starting to make a, make a difference in, uh, for sure, in the subsonic world. And then, of course, you know, Bringer Galactic, props out to them, have a, you know, a composite MOX 3 vehicle. Okay, so uh, I'm going to draw, kind of sketch this because this diagram is about to go away. This will be a, a key one that we'll want to remember so that compared to the takeoff weight, this is one minus lambda, right, the final amount of fuel, and we're going to just see trends. I'll just kind of draw a couple lines, like just to remind us that it's kind of a downward trend. Okay. Um, and in particular, the ones I'm going to I'm going to keep is for general aviation, maybe uh, lambda of 0.35 is okay. Um, for jets, maybe a lambda of 0.55 is okay. And then you know a big behemoth would be more, but that, that's that's going to be enough for our purposes to kind of write down those those two terms. Okay. Now the last one is lift to drag. We talked a little bit about lift to drag uh, last time uh, when we looked at you know, uh, supersonic airfoil, and that was just the airfoil itself. We then talked about the cigar shape and how the drag builds up on that one. Uh, both of those that I wrote down were just sort of the wave drag. That was just the drag associated with um, the shock waves, we did write down the wave associated with friction, but all, all of those drag pieces now kind of add up. And what I wanted to then show is kind of historically, what are some lift drags that we end up seeing? And so on my right, you can see in red, sort of a, a subsonic vehicle that lift drags are pretty good, right? This, this is why we have pretty good ranges on most of our aircraft. I mean, this is pretty up there, right? The general aviation one that I may fly is, is not nearly this high, but um, kind of the big, you know, 737 type aircraft, Airbus aircraft are all going to have this is pretty good uh, lift to drags. But there's a the, there's absolutely sort of this hard limit, right? And this happens when you start approaching the speed of sound, portions of your aircraft start going supersonic. And so you pick up a lot of that wave drag, this transonic. And so all, you, a lot of the work on sort of these high speed business jets, a lot has actually been tweaking where, where does this knee curve of the knee and can you push it out? and still be able to fly, say, Trans-Pacific with good gas mileage, but also do it fast. Um, variable sweep is interesting. The F-14 had it. Uh, the B-1 bomber has it. If you can kind of change your configuration from kind of straight-ish wings to tucked-in wings, and then you, you can get kind of through this. A, a lot of that, really, the wing sweep, I know we haven't talked about it here, it's really uh, by sweeping your wings, you're actually pulling down the drag at Mach 1 and shifting it to the right a little bit. So that's super useful. That lets you kind of get through this. Uh, and then you have in green here, so this optimal supersonic. Now, um, th this is, you know, I, I, I want to get too much into wing sweep, but this level, it's, it's kind of the next level down with a bunch of equations, but you, you do see it here, so I won't, I won't comment too much on it. But wing sweep uh, primarily is going to be about um, for jet turbine aircraft pulling down that drag bump at Mach 1. If you're a rocket-based combined cycle, you don't necessarily have to do that. And then wing sweep is going to also have an effect on the temperature, on the stagnation. We've talked about skim temperature temperatures, but there's also very much so a stagnation temperature that shows up. Uh, but in general here, we're going to just kind of draw that curve so we also can look at it when the slide goes away. And just in general, you're seeing kind of this curve going down-ish. It, it, I know it flattens out in the green curve, but you kind of can keep doing that if, if I was to extend this to Mach 4, Mach 5, so on. And a standard approximation that's fairly well accepted, you could say, is that the lift over drag goes four times Mach number plus three divided by the Mach number. That, that's a fairly standard approximation to this um, 
just a reminder, a lot of things get buried into that. And it's certainly uh, for a given aircraft, a different angle of attack, that may not necessarily be true. All right. But with all of this, we're now ready to look at then the range. Okay. Um, because so beta is now being answered based on this. This is the, the beta that I can go take a look at in those curves. And so I'm going to uh, then just write down the final equation for range. I was going to erase it, but I'll just write this down, final equation for range. So as a reminder, the range equation. Now, um, we talked through how ISP times velocity, it's actually a constant number, right? ISP, once you hit ramjet, uh, ramjet, once you hit ramjet, ISP is basically a number over velocity. And so what I'm going to do, as opposed to writing 6,000 over Mach for my ISP, and then writing um, a Mach times the speed of sound, I'm just going to uh, basically say that this is, you know, well, fine, I'll write 6,000 over Mach is ISP, and then speed of sound is roughly Mach, um, it's 300 meters per second is speed of sound. And I'll put units in here. Um, if you try to write this in a calculator, just remember you got to convert from meters to miles. Um, in fact, I'll do it here. Um, 16.09 meters to one mile. Okay. So that's then um, ISP times velocity. And then uh, you have L over D. And so I can plug in the 4 times and Mach plus 3 over Mach for this term. And then natural log 1 minus the amount it took to get to cruise that's coming from the rocket equation here. Right? And again, this would be true even for a jet engine. This is just general, you know, you have to pick your thrust to weight and lift to drag, which we have. And then one over lambda, the final lambda is this picture here. So we're now in a position where we can take a look at what is the range. Now I'm going to back up to here to say, because because we've, we've established cruise and climb, like we, we, we went through and did all this stuff and we, did, we designed, we figured out the, the optimal design point that we could sit at, right? Mainly like this wing loading and this thrust, we're happy with the temperatures. Remember temperatures played a role in this. Uh, lift to right played a role in this. And so in the end, we can now come convert this. And so I'm now going to just show what it looks like then with rocket-based combined cycle and kind of all of our uh, answers that get into this. So this is sort of our plot of this at a high level. This just prove you to the, the size of the sandbox that we're playing in. And so these are the range of, of numbers. I'm showing kind of Mach 2 through Mach 5. Why, why am I not showing anything past Mach 5? Well, for an air breathing, if, right, if we're using our detonation engine to get to ramjet, then Mach 5 is already getting really, really hot for that ramjet, so I'm not going to talk about it anymore. Uh, if we weren't using our detonation engine to go to the ramjet, we were just trying to stay in pure detonation mode, then you would see us talking about Mach 9 like we have in the past. Uh, but we'll stay here and just say that, you know, huzzah, the detonation engine is really the right way to get the ramjet, and this is, this is a really interesting way to go do it that is, is earlier than we can do with just a pure detonation engine. So, um, the amount of propellant that you needed is on the y-axis, and then this is range in terms of miles. So highlighting a couple of things that are interesting. First one, just past 55% propellant is 5,000. That's that's enough to cross the Pacific, right? That's why this gets us super excited, right? And I'm showing you here at Mach 4. Um, certainly at Mach 3, that same amount of propellant gets you more, but, it, but right at, at Crossing the Pacific, that's a long range. You know, we really want to, in terms of the value proposition to the passenger, it's it's that, again, the trip, it's that two-hour trip that lets you get there, have that meeting, and you can come back. That may not necessarily be true. You know, in Mach 3, now maybe it's a two and a half hour. It, and maybe that's a, you can, maybe you can deal with that. That might be a, you know, pilot and passenger's choice if it's a small, small business jet version. Okay. Um, but the other one I want to highlight here as well is that even at that kind of general aviation level, 30%, right? You're, you're talking about 2,000 miles. Now, that's not um, that's not necessarily crossing the ocean. 3,500 would be crossing the Atlantic. This 2,000 might be crossing maybe crossing the Gulf uh, or maybe going from L.A. to Seattle. Might be doing kind of East Coast. And so there's, there's potentially something interesting there as well in terms of a smaller aircraft, more general aviation-sized aircraft. Um, 
I, I'd say general aviation, not not the tiny general aviation, but kind of let's talk like King Air, larger general aviation aircraft. But hey, is there something here that we can go build that gets you interesting city pairs that's at a smaller size? The answer is yes. And so, you know, this is the sandbox that we see at Venus. And so when we think through design, right, this 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 has been a really deep, deep dive into the world of design. And and I wanted to go through all this math. This is this is still just high level. Each one of these things, clearly you can go through and up the validity and up and, and verify and, and expand um, things like drag that we just kind of um, waved our hands over. And it really shows up clearly if drag is, is critically important in a high-speed aircraft. And so you need to get into things like wind tunnels and CFD. But this just first level says, is there or there or there? Does this engine truly unlock the hypersonic economy? And their answer is yes. At the speed and altitude that we are willing to fly, based on the temperatures, right, and we're seeing, based on the ISP that the detonation engine is providing on the way up to a ramjet, based on the packing that we can put in an aircraft, based on the lift to drag that we can establish at higher Mach numbers, the range turns out to be super interesting at relevant speeds, which is ultimately saying, yes, there's a market. So that's been a deep, deep dive into the world of design. And so you're actually now going to meet some of our design engineers on the next episode as they talk a little bit through what um, kind of day in their life looks like and what it means to go kind of from this, you know, sandboxy level stuff into the next level of design. Thanks.